Hey, hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Think Tech Hawaii studio for another crazy episode of Security Matters. Today, we're going to be in the weeds a little bit with a couple of guys that you're very familiar with. I have Rodney Thayer and Sal D'Agostino with me today, and they're going to try to educate me and you on what it took to get to this new protocol OSDP that we have in our industry. Guys, thanks for joining me again. I know I know you guys are both really busy, so I appreciate you taking the time out to jump on the show real quick. Yeah, aloha, Andrew. Thanks. Good to be with you again. Hey, thanks, man. Hey, um, so you guys have done your background before um, on this show. So let's take us through sort of the a lot of stuff people may not know about your work in policy and protocols and this sort of development. Uh, give us sort of that your histories in those aspects of your um, professional careers. <laughs> Rodney, Rodney, we'll start with you, yeah. man. OK, so I've been interacting with protocol standards since 1976. Uh, the X25 standard, I have a copy of that. Uh, I've been um, doing, since I do communications protocol development a lot, uh, I learned a long time ago that following the standard is a way, way easier way to, to sort of interact, you know, interoperate with other people. Uh, and uh, I've worked with the uh, CCITT standards, then IETF standards, and uh, IEEE standards, and ISO, and also electro uh, IEC things. So there's many standards organizations. and you end up having folks who participate in the standards process who go to the committee meetings and, you know, occasionally do outrageous things like I do, like actually try to code it and make sure the standard works. <laughs> um, and, uh, and so I, and anyway, and, and, and in the case of OSDP, I made the, uh, the eternal mistake of I was in a committee meeting and I said, where's the open source version? And everybody looked at me and said, tag, you're it. Wow. That's how you get a little extra side job. Never hey, volunteer. Yes. Anyway. <laughs> hey, Sal, uh, I know you're, um, Rodney calls you a policy diva. I don't know if you do a lot of policy work as well, but take us through your your history of uh, of this type of development work. Um, well, thanks, Andrew. Yeah, the uh, well, the standard stuff is something that I've been involved with. You know, a lot of it, like Rodney, comes out of the CCTV world. Um, you know, early on, um, as we had com a company called Computer Recognition Systems, we were developing um, you know various kinds of machine vision systems and. Um, there are a bunch of different standards that we were using there. A lot of them, you know, a lot of them varied in different parts of the world. So you had a television standard, which is called NTSC for the U.S., but if you're using a European camera, you had PAL. Um, yeah, you know, there were hardware standards that we were using. Um, you know, so and the way that you made you, you were able to have hardware and software interoperability was usually related to some kind of standards. Um, you know, there were bus standards that we used when we were building hardware boards, VME bus, ISA bus. Um, so, so yeah, I've been involved with it for a long time and then sort of come forward um, as I got involved around some of the identity stuff, I began to become more involved from, uh, you know, leaving a little bit of the hardware, you know, hands-on to be more of the policy diva, Rodney's coined the term, <laughs> he hasn't coined the term, but he's uh, christened me with it. Um, <laughs> you know, a, a lot of that, a lot of that was around identity. Um, a lot of that was around digital certificates and X509. That's where Rodney and I actually crossed paths and somehow haven't been able to get off the same road for <laughs> what, what seems like, you know, it's probably almost 15, probably pushing 20 years now. Um, and then, uh, and then been involved with um, actually working a lot with NIST around the PIPS 201 standard, um, been involved internationally with ICAO. Um, more recently in some of the work at what my other company, Open Consent, I've uh, been involved in developing standards around privacy notices and consent receipts. And obviously with SIA um, you know, helping around, uh, around the OSD protocol. So uh, yeah, I've been involved with a whole different kinds of sets of standards committee, helped actually write standards, worked in standards development organization and still very active today. Wow. So. I think most of the world doesn't know how difficult this this is and how much time it takes. Um, talk about the genesis. What 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 started the OSDP initiative, and then how did you guys both get involved with it? And Sal, we'll just uh, start with you. Well, I, actually, Rodney Rodney uh, sort of his grandfathered in slightly before me. I mean, I know I know I, I know the uh, the genesis story, but I'll I'll defer Rodney. Why don't you? Why don't you you, you want that? the OSDP origin story? Okay, exactly. Yeah. So. Um, <laughs> Uh, three vendors, Linnell, Mercury, and HID, got together and came up with a, a way of having readers and panels interoperate with other many with each other many years ago. And they actually went off and implemented some of that, the, the three vendors together. 
And then they realized that they wanted to have it be a more uh, widely adopted thing. So they took this, the, the specification they had at that point, and they on purpose gave it to SIA to sort of, so SIA kind of adopted it uh, as, a, as a standard and then on, on purpose put it on the, the process, put, start, invoke the process to put it on track to become an international standard. So the SIA participation started uh, around 2000, oh, I don't know, 10 years ago or something, 2008, 2009, somewhere in there. Um, it, uh, it was, uh, you know, it's, it started the process going and then it was, it was moving on. I mean, committees are hard, you know, a committee, you know, a camel is a horse built by committee. Uh, you know, so it's hard to get a bunch of people together and actually work on these things. And so it's been going on for a while and, and uh, we, we finally got to, got the thing set up as a, a on track to be an international electro technical commission standard. So um, that process activated a, uh, about five years ago and then, and then we, you know, we got to where we are today. Wow. And so the, so before we, you know, actually everybody's probably familiar with Wagan and, and we won't get into how, how Wagan's insecure, but was the initial push with this protocol, was it a recognition that that problem existed for the industry or was it just that the whole world was moving to more encrypted, more secure types of communications? So I mean, I think I, I mean, I think it was a combination of stuff, right? So there's the security piece, but you know, the thing about Wigan, it's one way, right? So you really, if you want to have functionality all the way out to the edge of a system and, and be, you know, centralized control, distribute, you know, managing remote control points, you need a bi-directional protocol. And if you're going to have a bi-directional protocol, it should be secure. So, I mean, I, I think it really, Rodney, right? It's a combination yeah. of those two things, security and bi-directional communications, and then having a common command set so that, you know, if you're a controller manufacturer, you can have a common set of commands that'll work with, a you know, all the different readers. So um, interoperability, can, you know, interoperability, security, and bi-directional communications, I think, are the three things that drive the standard, and they also drive the, the benefits of it. And yeah, so um, Wigan isn't really a protocol. It's more of a message format. You know, you get to send a number of bits, or probably up to about 50, and it goes from the reader to the panel. That's it. No, in the, as you said, there's no not bi-directional. There's also no way to really express uh, subtlety. So... The difference between a card read, a keypad read, a biometrics device telling you the person's using their duress finger, um, the reader going into tamper, all these things they had to figure out how to put into strange looking Wigan messages. And it was because mm. we didn't have actually have a, the concept of, a, of a, a message with a header and a control field and things like that. So that's why that was kind of the driver and that the, the, doing it more sophisticated, a, a more advanced way and then getting the security and control benefits out of it. Awesome. And I know it's evolved and we have, we have like OSDP now, and then we have also OSDP secure. Can you talk a little bit about the differences there? So um, OSDP, the, 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 these terms like OSDP secure, what's going on is that we're trying to take the, the standard and make sure that uh, we've got a description of these various capabilities that are done, that are uh, talked about in a way that we can we can use in the industry. So we want to make sure specifiers can specify what they want. If they wanted secure communications, we want to be able to do that. So that's OSDP secure. Uh, also, of course, we want to make sure everybody in the picture is, is on the same page on what we're doing, you know, what the customers are trying to ask for and what the vendors are going to go off and deliver. So there's OSDP, there's OSDP secure. There's also uh, three or four other kind of variations, biometrics and some other things. Yeah, and, 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 if I, and so one point along those lines, people have been talking a little bit about OSDP1 and OSDP2. Um, real, really, at this point, there is just the, the international standard, which is actually 1.7, and as soon as it's sort of cleaned up, it becomes 2.2, it's 2.17, two, 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 sorry, and becomes 2.2. Two. Um, and in 2.2, two, two, there are different profiles and the, and the profiles in two, oh. two are, are primarily a basic profile and a secure profile. And then as Rodney said, there's a, a biometric and a smart card extensions, other profiles. And that's true for the, the reader, which is known as the PD and the controller, which is the ACU. And, and PDs don't have to be just readers. They can be other things too, but so peripheral okay. device and access control unit, basic profile, secure profile, all of those things now, no one should be talking about anything except whether or not you conform to 2.2. .2. 
And, uh, yeah, and, and I mean, and that's really the way to go. So, I mean, uh, the, the earlier versions that people talked about, a lot of them didn't have the secure capability. So a lot of people think that the difference between one and two is security, but it's a little bit more nuanced than that. And that's, you know, that's one of the mm. things we're trying to educate people about. That's awesome. Is the, are all these various um, features of the protocol that you discussed, is that where the I, IEC weighs in or is these are just things that, that the, we saw a need to develop as we as the protocol got built or, or do you have to have various things for it to be like an international protocol or, or you know an international standard the IEC basically uh, for the most part just to, just took the things that the working group put into the uh, the document so the so CIA formed a working group which is multiple uh, parties, vendors, and end users, and other kinds of practitioners and folks, and, and so you can have an open, you know, open group doing it to make sure we have good group consensus. Uh, the IEC process was mostly around formatting the document and pulling it into their framework. So these numbers actually have a meaning. So 60839 is a, a specific group, and then the dash 11, it's 60839 dash 11 dash 5. That's the standard we have course is really good for salespeople to give you a swoopy looking number. Um, <laughs> the 60839 is apparently a committee label. The dash 11 means it's the access control area within the IEC. So there's a, a dash 11 dash one, which is a, a general description of access control systems and other things are in this same area. So some of the OMDIF standards are in this as uh, IEC 60839 dash 11 dash 31, 32, and 33. Gosh. So the so in using their numbering <laughs> scheme, we're, we're in the access control tent on planet IEC. And so the front of the tent says 60839-11. And we happen to be group five. Wow. Wow. Yeah, we're, yeah, we're, we're, we're troop five. Right. Troop, troop five. five. Is, um, and so does it go, did it go, because I know there's ANSI, I, I heard them mentioned before. So does it go to ANSI and then to an international? Because ANSI is what, American National Standard Standards Institute? Infrastructure. It, it goes right. to a standards development organization which sponsors it being done, which in this case was SIA, okay. uh, the Security Industry Association. And then they go through the standards, the international standards organization hierarchy. So in the United States, uh, SIA is a, a standards development organization that's accredited by the national body for the United States, which is the American National Standards Institute. Okay. And then the national body for the United States uh, is accredited with the international body. So like in... In the UK, they had the British Standards Institute. Um, and uh, in Germany, they have an organization whose name I won't try to pronounce. It has an acronym too, uh, you know, <laughs> that kind of thing. Um, and so each country will have their own, most countries have their own standards. And, 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 some, and some of them create their own standards, which are not. So, so we had as an oh. example, so the, a lot of the National Institute of Standards standards um, are standards which then reference other international standards. So like going back to the FIPS 201 stuff and some of the special publications, it will then reference some of the pre-existing standards around smart cards or you know, 7816, Rodney, right? As, as, a, as a set of stuff, which you then, so you, you, you build stuff on top of other stuff. Sometimes an international group will create a standard. NIST is built for the US government. Um, so, okay. you know, that's, that, that's their charter. Um, so th their stuff doesn't immediately wash over as international stuff. So it may seem to strange to think you've got a, a national institute of standards and you've got American national standards Institute, but there's a little bit of a rationale behind why you've got those two bodies. Um, NIST doesn't accredit standards development organizations. They sort of stand on their own as one. ANSI is the body that accredits SDOs and, and the Security Industry Association, as Rodney just said, is an accredited SDO. It, uh, yeah. there's, there's plenty of arcana around standards. Yeah, These the, the standards organizations came out of you know, when we needed physical standards. So NIST used to be the National Bureau of Standards, and you know, their job was to keep the official copy of the yardstick. You know, there was a stick that was a yard long, and they kept it in a vault somewhere. And the <laughs> thing he's showing you is what, what we in the industry, I, I learned to call this an IEC connector, the thing that Sal's waving around. That little okay. trapezoid shape, that funny. If I go, if, when it is permissible, of course, if I go visit, uh, Andrew, if I go visit you for a business meeting in Hawaii and I forget the cable for my laptop, it may well have that IEC connector in the end. And because of standards, I'd be able to go to a shop and buy one. Right. That right. you can gotcha. buy an IEC connector in Ala Moana. 
Yeah. So all a lot of work goes into these standards, gang. We are uh, just past our break. So we're going to take one minute. We're going to pay some bills. I'm going to come back and get into the sort of some of the feature sets of this OSDP that people should be paying attention to. We'll be right back. Aloha. I'm Kili'i Akina, the host of Hawaii Together on the ThinkTech Hawaii Broadcast Network. Hawaii Together deals with the problems we face in paradise and looks for solutions, whether it's with the economy, the government, or society. We're streamed live on ThinkTech biweekly at 2 p.m. on Mondays. I want to thank you so much for watching. We look forward to seeing you. Again, I'm Kili'i Akina. Aloha. And we're back with Rodney Sayer and Sa Rodney Thayer and Sal D'Agostino. Uh, we're talking about OSDP today, and OSDP has achieved its IEC, or it's been approved by the IEC. I guess that a uh, standard or some date will be set when it's officially announced. So the world can now start to use OSDP and and use it in according to this standard, right? right. So. Yeah, it it's 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 happened. It was in in the end of May that it actually passed. So it's officially an IEC standard at this point. Okay, and we're and we the world should be looking at the two point two version of that well, standard. So right now you can uh, any minute now uh, we're here in July you'll be able to go to the IEC bookstore online and buy a copy of the the IEC version, which is the six hundred eight three nine dash eleven dash five. The SIA version of that is going to be two point two, which they're going to publish immediately after that. And the reason we have two different standards is two different versions of it is because the IEC process, it's an international standard that takes a long time to get things moving through it. Uh, so there's some things that SIA will pro probably want to add as uh, enhancements. And so they'll do it in, the, in their version first, they'll probably be a 221. And then uh, that'll get rolled over into through the standards process and do an IEC update. And there, there's also there's also some uh, economic advantage. The uh, the IEC and ISO uh, they're they're pretty good at collecting Swiss francs, and C is a little kinder towards the uh, the patrons <laughs> of the standard. <laughs> That's good to know. There, there is um, an expectation that people who are somebody you know like if you deal with a vendor who's using OSDP, somebody somewhere in the organization should have bought a copy of the standard. The and IEC yes, they actually yes they actually would have okay. to go and get money to buy it and and. Uh, I don't think it's exactly a dollar a page, but it's a, you know it's an 80, 90 page document. It's probably going to be around a hundred dollars. Wow! It, from 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 the IEC, I think you'll find it's a quarter or so from CIA. At least that's my that's my understanding, right? Is that uh, CIA written CIA maintains the right to publish it as part of this process, which was a pretty cool thing that they actually accomplished. Ah. So. Um, so so let's talk about the built world, right? I'm an integrator. My customer says, hey, I, I found out about this OSDP. I want to get rid of my wagon stuff. I want to get a secure protocol going. Um, are the manufacturers, by and large, uh, built out in your guys' estimation? Um, do we need to be careful uh, with, uh, you know, can their hardware handle version 2.2, for example? Or are these questions that integrators and, and architects and, you know, the rest of us out here on the the front end of those requests? Do we need to be asking those questions or proofing those in our labs or whatever before we roll them out to customers? Yes, there, there is a, a certain amount. To, using a standard, it, I mean, it's nice to have a document that defines it and it's nice when the implement the, the vendors implement it, the implementers implement it. Um, so for example, you can buy readers from HID that do OSDP and you know, 50 other vendors. You can buy access control systems, uh, Johnson Control software, I mean, uh, Linnell, a bunch of other people you know, support it. Um, just because it's in the system, you, you got to go and use it. Uh, so the the integrators have to um, be updated on how to go uh, deploy this stuff. Uh, the The simple example is, and we have seen this. You know, really solid integrator, really solid team member. Nobody told them it wasn't Wigan. They get out to the job site, they wire up the Wigan. <laughs> Whoops! Whoops! So and and that and and I am not talking about the awesome team member with the screwdriver in the hand. I'm talking about the paperwork we forgot to give them. So we yeah. have things like that. 
Um, sure. We also get things now that it's a protocol. We we have some of the same problems you have in the IoT world, where you know everything's a, a device. You know you have to do firmware updates to your Nike shoes, your Tesla cars, and your light bulbs <laughs> to Cisco controls, right? Uh, yeah. So you have to worry about things like firmware updates. You know nobody ever had to do a firmware update in a two by four. So it's yep. a change in process for the vendor supply chain. And for uh, the customers to understand that we need to customers. do that too. Yeah, yeah, there's a cost there. Okay. Right. And then there's customer processes that they're going to want to do uh, and OSDP would help it. So if you're in an environment where you're following the security policies, these good policies, that's why I use the term policy diva. That's a hint that it's a good thing. Um, the, if you have policies that say you have to have very strict inventory descriptions of all your equipment, you have to, then the, 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 end user operating the system has to know enough to push the button to pull a report to tell them what version of firmware they have in all their readers. And they need to push the button. The electronic access control system needs to facilitate them doing that. And all the equipment down the line has to support it. So we all have to together as a team actually support the end user using some of these things. Mm. Yeah, which, so that, which, which then at the end of the day uses a command in OSDP, which, which asks for the ID of the device and you, lo and behold, you get all that back, right? So it's not, you know, so the capabilities are built in, but you need to be able to use them. And then I think the more that you understand that those capabilities exist, and then you can effectively get the, 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 as, the current state of your as-built equipment that's out in the field, you know, that's, the, you know, that's, that's a real useful thing. I, you know, and the fact that now you have um, access control systems that can communicate all the way to the edge. Now you can get information all the way from the edge. So understanding that you can do that and building that into uh, not only you know, to your operational policy, because um, operational policies should be leveraging the cap technological capabilities and mapping to whatever your corporate requirements are. You can now do those sorts of things. Um, and the, I mean, and the other thing, you know, that you know, just a, you know, plug here for some some of the other work that we're involved with is that, um, you know, OSDP verified is now a thing. So the Security Industry Association has put together a conformance program so that so where there's actually testing of these devices to see if they conform to these different profiles. So again, the tricky thing would be, oh, oh, it's you know, we we implement OSDP, but maybe you don't implement secure channel. Right. So, or maybe you don't implement the, the firmware update, which is a, you know, kind of a critical capability, which is part of the file transfer capability of the protocol. So, so your ability to remotely update firmware is a result of using the, the standard as a result of having the file transfer capability functional. Now you can do OSDP, you can, you can have secure channel and not have an ability to update firmware. So you're, you're taking some mm. advantage of the protocol, but not necessarily full advantage of it. Mm. So, so, th so as it, so as an integrator, as an end user, um, you know, those are things to keep an eye on. And that's why certification programs are, uh, you know, are useful and, you know, full disclosure, you know, I'm, I'm testing some of the first OSDP devices to, to receive an OSDP verified certification. Uh, the first devices went through certification last week. So, and oh, the, wow. uh, you know, the, the, the next ones are sitting right over there um, <laughs> and see, it will have an announcement about those devices i think probably end of next week or something when i finish the second device because we'll announce the first two that go through the program and that'll be one device that's certified for secure pd and secure acu and the other device which will be um, certified as a secure pd and one of the things to and to go on we, we've been very careful in constructing that program so that it's not so that it's it's flexible and doesn't put too heavy a load on manufacturers both in terms of time or in terms of cost so as an example if you've got a firmware set that works across a number of readers you don't have to test every reader so you can if your firm works like works across a number of different devices you 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 can be certified as a pd for all those SKUs for a device that uses that firmware so you know so we've done a number of things to make it easy um to get to get certified and to motivate people to get certified and uh you know we're looking forward to uh to then being able to go to a see a web page 
look up a device, see that it's certified. And then, so then for you, Andrew, as an integrator, someone who's a customer or the A&E community, when they're recommending that OSDP be included as part of the specification, they could also include as part of that requirement that you're, it's a, it's a sort of OSDP verified device. And, you know, it'll take a little while for it to get to the point where that's practical, but you know, that's some, that's a relatively short-term goal that we, uh, we are you know, pretty hopeful of achieving. Man, we've come so far from, I remember, I remember the first time Rodney during, uh, I think at Interop, right? When he finally got, we demonstrated some bi-directional comms. I mean, right. this is just, this is just from its sort of maturity stage. It's finally, and I guess maybe to your all's vision, this all happened at the same time, but to someone like me who's been able to check in with it periodically, check in with you guys periodically, you know, as a as an industry that can now look at this and say, wow, we've got OSDP verified services coming out where we can check and see people that are planning to implement this stuff can start to really do it with a little more confidence. You know, it's kind of been a, as you, to your to your point earlier, Rod, you guys are still wiring stuff up, waiting when it's supposed to be deployed OSDP, right? So there's been a, a bit of a disconnect there. And it just sounds, it seems to me like it's really uh, in its sort of final phases of maturity as a, an industry yep. protocol. Yeah. Yeah, there's no reason not to as well. I mean, the, there's, there's almost no difference in the cost of the devices. You know, it's four wire as opposed to six typically for Wigan. Um, yeah, the, the, there's no difference in the cost of the controllers. Um, you know, the, the life cycle operational costs are significantly less if you're, you're implementing the full protocol. Um, you know, you're getting better security. Um, so there's, there's really very little rationale other than the fact that, you know, it's, you know, pe people tend to do what they've done in the past, mm -hmm. but we're actually beginning to see people realize now that, you know, the CIA has done a good job. You know, there's, there seems to be quite a, you know, different companies are, companies are actually running their own webcasts talking about OSDP, which yeah. is an amazing thing, right? So, um, so there's, and, and Rodney, you've got a list that you put together, right? That, yeah, the, um, you know, I, the, this is, I, I run a, a Randomly on the side, not an official thing. I run a site called OSDP.equipment, uh, which is just a list of OSDP vendors that we've identified, the, the, you know, visible uh, in public. Um, there's 75 entries on it now. Awesome. Uh, at least half of them are readers. Uh, lots of panel vendors, um, biometrics vendors, other kinds of things. So it's definitely it's not just one or two vendors doing it. It's definitely there, there's a an OSDP marketplace now with multiple vendors, and and because it's interoperable, you have choices. All right, gang, um, we are out of time today, but gentlemen, I really appreciate you sharing your wisdom and your experience with this protocol with us. Thanks for keeping that website well, up. OSDP. I, 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 I want to give a shout out to Joe Gittens, who's the Joe who's Gittins. The, yeah, thanks, who's Joe. The, who's, the, who's the chair of this work group and has also been there from the beginning, um, has done tremendous amount of work. And his work's not done, uh, but the, thank you, thank you, <laughs> thank Joe. You Joe. Uh, yes. Thank you, Joe, and thank you, thank you, Don Erickson as well. Um, it's been great working with you, and really look forward to continuing to do so. All right, thanks, guys. We'll see you again next week. Aloha, everybody. Take care. <laughs>